Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless we're at the most dangerous point in the history of our country because of the power of weaponry nuclear weapons in particular weapons that are so powerful i can tell you this uh, president xi of china putin kim jong-un all of these leaders are at the top of their Come game on. mentally they're at the top of their game and they're dealing with somebody that's not at the top of their, his game. I love this country. I don't want to see this country get into a nuclear war and be so badly damaged. What we say won't matter. This won't matter. This place won't matter. Nothing will matter because practically nothing's going to be here anymore. The level of power, the level of, of power with the weapons and the weaponry, that's real weaponry. That's worse than the weaponry that we were talking about a little while ago. This is the ultimate... This is obliteration, maybe world obliteration. And we have a man that is not capable of even discussing it. He talked the other night about uh, that nuclear doesn't matter so much. What matters is, think of this, global warming. The only global warming that matters to me is nuclear global warming, because that's the real deal. He said it's an existential threat. He loves the words existential threat that global warming is an existential threat. Tomorrow, we could have a war that will be so devastating that you could never recover from it. Nobody can. The whole world won't be able to recover from it. And he's talking about something in 400 years from now, the, the oceans will rise by an eighth of an inch. Look, we have a man that shouldn't be doing this job. He's not qualified. He's not mentally sharp enough. We have war in Europe. We have war in the Middle East. Um, and. We have the Iranians, according to reports, even the IAEA, may be very close to nuclear weapons. Very close. That should scare everybody because yep. they're crazy enough that I think they would they would use them. And precarious situation, more dangerous, than, I think, than at Most any point. Most dangerous time in the history of our country. I would agree. Is America in Bible prophecy? Bible scholars debate on whether America is in Bible prophecy. The United States of America is never explicitly mentioned. There are two places in the Bible that could refer to the U.S. The first place is found in Revelation 18, 1-24, where the Apostle John declares this, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her, just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise any more. Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, and cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, 
wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you, and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these things, who became rich by her, will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance, and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she is made desolate. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you any more. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you any more, and the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you any more. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you any more, and the voice of bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you any more. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived, and in her was found the blood of prophets and saints, and of all who were slain on the earth. America does seem to fit the description of the great city of Babylon. Is America Babylon, in which God will destroy in one hour? The second place is found in Ezekiel 38, 10-13, where the prophet Ezekiel proclaims, Thus says the Lord God, On that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind, speaking of Russia, Iran, and a coalition of nations, and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, speaking of Israel, to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against the people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods, who dwell in the midst of the land. Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all our young lions will say to you, Have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? Many Bible scholars believe that the merchants of Tarshish is Great Britain, and all their young lions is the United States of America. If this is true, why is America saying, Have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? America is Israel's ally. Why aren't we defending Israel? If America is indeed all their young lions, something catastrophic must have happened. What could this catastrophic event be? Is it World War III, in which the United States was decimated? Is it a financial collapse, in which the United States didn't have the resources to help Israel? Could it be that the United States simply turned against Israel and didn't want to help? Or could it possibly be the rapture of the church? I pray if all their young lions is America, that by God's grace and mercy, it is the rapture. For those who are left behind, it is time to run to Jesus. You more than likely will not survive the seven-year tribulation when Jesus returns, as the Antichrist will be looking to kill all Jews and Christians, and will require the inhabitants of the earth to take a mark signifying that they worship him as God. Without this mark, you will not be able to buy or sell. It would be so much easier to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, as Jesus provided an escape for his true followers, as we read in Luke 21:36, Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, 
The pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. We are following a lot of breaking news tonight as we come on the air. We want to start with a strain of the bird flu never detected in humans before. It's now being blamed for the death of a man in Mexico. Here's what we know right now. A 59-year-old man died back on April 24th. The World Health Organization says he died after contracting the H5N2 strain of the virus. But they aren't exactly sure because he had no previous exposure to poultry or to other animals. They're not sure how he got it. His death came a week after developing a fever, shortness of breath, diarrhea, and nausea. The organization adding he did suffer from underlying health issues. The announcement comes as an outbreak of a different and more common strain of the bird flu was detected in a number of dairy cows in the U.S. There have also been at least three human cases tied to the H5N1 strain right here in the U.S., all connected to farm workers. So, Sam, talk to us about this case that we know out of Mexico that we're covering tonight. You know, the weird thing is here is that he was not in any contact with any livestock or poultry, so they're not sure how he got it. Do we know if he was in contact with lots of other people? A decent number of people, Tom. And so the World Health Organization says this 59-year-old had about 30 contacts. 17 of them were at the hospital. One of those people reported having a runny nose. But, Tom, not one of them tested positive for this strain of the avian flu. Now, here's what's interesting. There were 12 other contacts near that man's house. They said that seven of those people were symptomatic, five asymptomatic. It's not clear exactly what symptomatic means. But, again, none of them tested positive either. Now, were the seven symptomatic at one point control? contracting a strain of this virus, but it just didn't affect them the same way, and they didn't test positive by the time the testing actually proceeded, or did they never get it at all? Not clear. But among almost three dozen contacts so far, this man is the only one to actually test positive for this strain, H5N1. So what do we know about this new strain, right? And, and how is it different from what's been circulating in the U.S. in, in our livestock? Sure, and I should say, sorry, H5N2 is the version in Mexico. Right. H5N1 is the version in the United States. As for H5N1, it had been running rampant, as you said, through cattle. It had led to cases, positive cases of three people, at least, in the United States have contracted it. None of them died, but it was also obviously poultry before it was cattle in the U.S. When it comes to Mexico, so far, the only cases have been in poultry. And again, as you mentioned, Tom, this had not been detected in a single human anywhere in the world until now. It's the only case, and he has died. But there is a backstory to this. That 59-year-old man, according to his relatives, Tom, was bedridden for some three weeks with other conditions, right, unrelated to the acute symptoms he experienced from H5N2, but then also had underlying medical conditions and then reports these symptoms. So is this a function of his medical health, or is it a function of the strain itself? That's what scientists right now are trying to determine. And the weird thing is, if he's been bedridden for all those weeks, how did this guy get it? And anything happening is a matter of when not if. So we need to have a placeholder for that. For the disease we don't know, that may come. And that was when we gave the name disease X. Gain of function research, which is yeah. when you manipulate these viruses to make them highly transmissible right. to humans. This raises real ethical questions about this gain of function research happening in labs, not just in Wuhan, but around the world. Um, you think they should all be stopping this? Yeah, I wrote an op-ed with Mark Siegel in the uh, Wall, uh, Wall Street Journal a, a little while back, really calling for a moratorium on gain-of-function research. I think it puts our world at great risk. Um, we have the risk of natural spillover, but there is a species barrier. I, I'm obviously most worried about bird flu. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, it takes five amino acid change uh, for it to be effectively infecting humans. That's a pretty heavy species barrier. But th this virus is already now in 26 mammal species, as you saw most recently, cattle. Um, but, but in the laboratory, I could make it highly infectious for humans in months because it's been wow. published the uh, five amino acids that I need to change. And so I don't think that research should be done. That's the real threat. That's the real biosecurity threat that these university labs are doing these bio, uh, bio experiments that are intentionally modifying viruses and bird flu, I think, is going to be the cause of the great pandemic, uh, where they are teaching these viruses how to be more infectious for humans. As ceasefire talks continue, we're focusing on concerns that the war in Gaza could spiral into a wider regional conflict. 
Earlier today, Israel said it would soon decide whether to launch an offensive in Lebanon, where it has clashed with the Iran-backed group Hezbollah for months. Now, those clashes have intensified in recent days, with munitions coming over the border into northern Israel and sparking brush fires there. This Wednesday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said his country was prepared for what he called intense action in the north and that security would be restored one way or another. On a visit to Israel's border with Lebanon, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu delivered strong words. We are prepared for a very intense operation in the north. One way or another, we will restore security to the north. His trip to the northern city of Kiryat Shimona came after the region was engulfed in forest fires earlier this week when Hezbollah strikes hit an area of hot, dry and windy conditions, leading to the evacuation of several residents. The city, however, has been largely empty for the last eight months due to regular fire between Israeli troops and Iran-backed Hezbollah fighters. On both sides of the border, tens of thousands of people have fled their homes in what has been the worst conflict between Israel and Hezbollah since they went to war in 2006. According to AFP, at least 455 people have been killed in Lebanon, including 88 civilians, and the Israeli army has said at least 14 of their soldiers and 11 civilians have been killed since October. Netanyahu's words come at a time when cross-border fighting has been intensifying and just a day after the chief of the Israel Defence Force said the army was approaching a decision point. Hezbollah has increased its attacks in recent days and we are prepared. After a very good process of training up to the level of a general staff exercise to move to an offensive in the north. With the situation becoming increasingly untenable, the US has said Washington does not want to see an all-out war. Meanwhile, Human Rights Watch released a report on Wednesday accusing Israel of violating international law with the widespread use of white phosphorus in southern Lebanon, which could put civilians at risk. And the diplomatic service of the European Union said they are concerned about the ever-growing destruction and forced displacement of civilians on both sides of the border. For more on this story, I'm joined by Stephen Cook, a senior fellow for Middle East Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. What are the chances, in your view, that this could spiral into an all-out war between Israel and Hezbollah like we saw in 2006? Well, I think the chances are very, very high that this is going to happen. And that's why you see the Israelis preparing uh, in the north. They simply uh, cannot live with Hezbollah up on uh, the Israeli border for fear of, one, uh, an October 7th style attack on Israeli border communities that really up are right on the border. And two, uh, Hezbollah has been using munitions that um, uh, end up deep into Israeli territory, making the northern part of Israel uninhabitable. So uh, absent a diplomatic initiative that would solve this problem and push Hezbollah back beyond the Litani River, uh, which is some miles north of uh, the uh, Lebanese-Israel border, the Israelis uh, vow to take uh, military action to push Hezbollah back. We are, as the Israeli chief of staff said, getting close to that moment. Well, so a Hezbollah leader told the broadcaster Al Jazeera yesterday that the group does not want a full-blown war, but at the same time asserting that it's prepared for one. How equipped is Hezbollah for a full-out war with Israel? I think you should take it with a grain of salt when Hezbollah says it doesn't want a full-out war, given how often they have been firing on Israeli positions um, since October 8th. But nevertheless, um, this is a, a very different kind of conflict that the Israelis would be fighting, given the um, large store of rockets and missiles and precision munitions that Hezbollah has. Some estimates are between 100,000 and 150,000 rockets and missiles that could reach all parts of Israel. Um, so this would be something that would um, certainly pose a, a, a general risk to the Israeli public in the same way that October 7th, as horrific as it was, did not pose a risk to the broader Israeli public. But do you think that the war in Gaza is playing into that, that response from Hezbollah, meaning you know, Hezbollah is looking at the destruction in Gaza and, and saying to itself, it doesn't want the same result in Lebanon? Well, certainly part of the Israeli strategy in Gaza and the Israeli strategy in the north up to this point is to do as much damage as possible to send a message to Hezbollah's leaders. Um, certainly um, the images coming out of, uh, out of Gaza, as well as the damage that the Israelis have done already to Hezbollah infrastructure along, um, along the border, um, one would 
think has already given the Hezbollah leadership some pause. But as this conflict has continued, Hezbollah has grown bolder and bolder in its attacks on Israel. And as I said, um, uh, firing deeper and deeper into Israeli territory. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17.1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. This is the Buk M1, a medium-range surface-to-air missile system that comes from Russia. On Wednesday, Russia's Defence Ministry released this footage showing the system being deployed alongside an anti-tank gun and a D-30 howitzer. <laughs> in what they've said is in the zone of a so-called special military operation in the Donetsk district in Ukraine. Russia reportedly produces nearly 3 million munitions a year to arm their artillery, firing around 10,000 shells a day, compared to 2,000 from Ukraine. It's an advantage President Vladimir Putin is determined to keep. Speaking to international news agencies in St Petersburg on Wednesday, he said that it would mark a dangerous step for Western nations to allow Ukraine to use their weapons to strike targets inside Russia. If they consider it possible to deliver such weapons to the combat zone to launch strikes on our territory and create problems for us, why don't we have the right to supply such weapons of the same type to some regions of the world where they can be used to launch strikes on sensitive facilities of the countries that do it to Russia? He spoke particularly of Germany, who recently joined the United States in allowing Ukraine to use the long-range weapons that they are supplying to Kiev on Russian targets, which, according to Putin, would completely destroy their international relations and undermine international security. Russia hit the city of Dnipro on Tuesday, a key front line between Russia and Ukrainian troops. Ukraine managed to shoot down two missiles, but debris injured six people including a one-month-old baby and damaged homes. A school was also hit in another Russian strike. Down south, the Kremlin continued its shelling on Kherson. Sixteen settlements on the right bank of the region were under fire in the past 48 hours and several houses were damaged following a strike on a residential neighborhood. Moscow's ground offensive in the north has opened a new front and put more pressure on Ukraine's forces in the south. The tornado outbreak in Maryland, near our nation's capital, on a deadly twister striking in Michigan. Sam is in for Ginger standing by with the big picture. But first, let's go to Elizabeth Schulze in Maryland with a glimpse of the damage there. We are in a dense residential area, just about 30 miles northwest of the nation's capital. You can see here that cars are trapped, power lines are down. And if you look over here, you can see that this tree has been completely split in half, fell onto that house. This is one of several homes that's now encased by fallen trees and debris after the tornado tore through the neighborhood. Get back down, get back down. Overnight, multiple tornadoes touching down in Maryland. There's two, there's two injuring five after a night of severe weather. This is all the first time I've seen a tornado. The first landing in Poolsville, Maryland, right next to a middle school. Oh my God. Before moving east to the city of Gaithersburg, hurling debris through the air. <laughs> Fallen trees blocking roads and damaging several houses, including one that collapsed and trapped five residents inside, all injured but remarkably expected to survive. The tornado hit, I just, here, loud thuds, and and I just go to my bathtub, you know, hide there. Overnight, authorities urge residents to take cover immediately. We never had nothing like this before. Meantime, outside Detroit, a deadly EF1 tornado killing a two-year-old after a tree crashed into the bedroom of this home. This was uh, this was a, a tough day. It's heartbreaking. Something that's hard to take, hard to swallow, and probably be many, many sleepless nights. And the canopy of this gas station toppled over as drivers were filling up. Never in my life I was scared this much.
Tonight, dangerous temperatures are scorching much of the western U.S. More than 31 million Americans from California to Texas are under excessive heat warnings and advisories, with cities like Sacramento and Brownsville hitting daily record highs. CBS's Ben Tracy reports the mercury is topping the triple digits in at least five states. In California's Central Valley, Tomarawa. Joe Del Bosque is telling his farm workers to watch for signs of heat stress, take extra breaks, and hydrate. How much do you worry about the folks out here working? We watch our folks very carefully. That's when we'll go to either plan B, which means take more breaks, drink more water, or we go to plan C, which means shut it down. The heat dome trapping hot air over a wide swath of the West is sending temperatures soaring 15 to 20 degrees above average. Early season heat waves have outsized impacts on, on human health. John Abatzaglu is a climate scientist at UC Merced. He says it's unusual to get this hot this early. Scientists say this western heat wave is made three times more likely by human-caused climate change. What is climate change doing to heat waves? Yeah, climate change is giving these heat waves a boost. They're also getting hotter and lasting longer. Extreme heat is the deadliest weather-related event in the United States, killing more people than hurricanes, floods, and tornadoes combined. Here in Merced, California, it's going to be 104 degrees today, a near record. This fair opens tonight, and several years ago, they moved this from July up to June because it was too hot in July, and now apparently it's too hot in June as well. The seven-year tribulation is fast approaching this world, and the news headlines prove it. God in His grace and mercy is trying to shake the world out of its complacency. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. Jesus is likening last day's events to a woman in labor. The closer we get to Jesus' second coming, last day's signs and calamities will become more frequent and more intense. Following the rapture of all the true Christians to heaven, the Bible warns that the wrath of God will be poured out on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes extreme heat, as we read in Revelation 16, 8, and 9. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Luke 21, 26 through 28. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with Him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep,
God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.